Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on crisis communications and managing difficult conversations for accountants and bookkeepers. My name is Charles Clark and today I'm joined by Heather Smith who needs no introduction. So Heather, uh, I'll hand over to you um, and I'll chime back in as we go with any questions and observations um, as we go along. So Heather, over to you. Much. Thank you very much for handing over to me, Charles, and thank you for um, having me on this webinar. And thank you to everyone who's um, given up uh, your, your uh, lunch break, potentially, um, to uh, listen in here. Um, I hope you get a lot from this uh, session. Um, and please, um, there is a chat area. Please um, actively ask any questions that you may have there. Um, and Charles will, um, let's see there, we'll pop to uh, that. Charles will um, share them um, actively as uh, we need to through the session. Um, questions that are relevant to what I'm touching on. Um, and then if there are other questions that are relevant, well, maybe we'll uh, look at developing um, another webinar. So that's great. So communication skills are um, a vital part of working with clients, colleagues and the business community. And adapting your communication styles improves, improves your effectiveness. And this is especially important during um, a crisis communication and having difficult conversations. So um, today what we're going to cover is we're going to talk about planning and preparing. We're going to talk about um, empathy, emotional intelligence, leadership and authority. At difficult conversations and how to have them and uh, the words to use some tips and techniques social media um, and the platform tools that you could potentially use and we'll talk about um, mental health and wellness and professional counseling and we will also have our uh, time and opportunity during the session for um, uh, Q&A as, as we go through so initially let's see we have a uh, cartoon up here. Charles, do you want to talk to the cartoon? <laughs> yeah, well, I just thought it was a rather funny way of, uh, and I'm sure you've all been there before, where uh, you get to sort of um, a point in time and your client is basically saying, um, great, no, I think I've done everything. Can you please uh, provide me with the relevant, um, I suppose, documentation or sort of, or outcomes? And you're thinking, that's great, but you haven't done the sort of the one thing I've asked you to do. So um, whether it's something simple like sort of getting receipts or something major, um, I'm sure you will have had many of those conversations yourselves. Um, I just thought it was a really sort of funny way to um, illustrate what can for many people be a actually really uncomfortable uh, feeling when they do have to have those communications with people. Um, and then the second one, I just thought, you know, in light of, um, the current situation that we're all um, currently experiencing, uh, it can feel a bit like um, everyone's sort of hair is on fire and running around and not knowing what to do. And um, if you've had crisis management training, um, you might have, you might, your hair might be on fire even more. Um, but I just thought it was, um, I suppose, to highlight that uh, these, these skills and insights aren't necessarily something that we would um, utilize in every day, you know, a lifestyle. But now we are, we are sort of in a, in a very different situation. And so a really, I suppose, good opportunity to take a step back and sort of look at what are some of the tools and techniques we can use to deal um, with crises and then how we can apply them to, I suppose, our everyday business. Thank you, Charles. So moving on to talking about uh, planning and preparing. So, um, in terms of planning and preparing, um, I'm going to, we've got a big webinar today and covering a lot of things today. So I'm going a bit faster and talking a bit um, faster than I would normally talk at. However, when you are um, preparing um, for your crisis conversations, I would suggest putting on a slower and more warming and comforting tone. So <laughs> I realise that you might not get that from me today. So as part of um, your preparation for crisis communication, you need to establish the timing of sending out the information and the timeliness of the information. So during a crisis, people are being bombarded with information. Think about the urgency of the inf information and what do they need to know? And when do they need to be, when will they be receptive to receiving it? Frequent communication doesn't always mean better communication. 
So be mindful that too many messages result in notification fatigue and people don't have the capacity to read and absorb all the messages they're reading, especially in times of crisis. If you suggest every message is important, it's simply like shouting at them constantly to get their attention and they're going to turn off. So for example, what you could do is let people know the consistency um, of your messages. Maybe I'll send you a newsletter every Tuesday or there'll be a Q&A webinar every Thursday afternoon. So they know uh, when to expect the messages and they have an appreciation of if these messages um, are important or not. Don't assume that you can rely on the same communication platform and consider what platforms are used by the people that you want to communicate with. Be they clients, be they your staff, be they your suppliers, be they your community. Make sure that everyone in your team is on the same page and is consistent with their messages being shared. Um, and one of the interesting things is in, in a crisis situation, it can be very hard to craft clear messages and it can be hard to craft or write empathetic responses. You need to plan them ahead of time. However, um, it might be quite difficult to do that. Um, because what we've been going through has been quite unusual. But when you are in the right headspace and have some clarity, you may pre-write genuine emotional snippets. Now, I know that sounds a bit robotic, but let me explain. You could use templated responses or text expander technology, um, and these can work well in common situations, such as the opening sentence or the closing sentence, or something that you're frequently saying, such as, thanks for writing today. I'm happy to take a look at this with you. And bam, you just put it out there. You don't lose any of that emotional energy yourself because you're actually using your templated response to um, um, make that response. Uh, and for those of you who use G Suite um, um, email, it actually has this artificial intelligence that actually works in the email and it tries to auto finish a lot of your sentences. And I rely heavily on that because it is, has a real emotional um, and heartfelt tone to it. Also, when you're sending the message out, tag the importance of the message. Look, just very simply, you need to read this right now or this is sort of something you just need to be aware of and let me know in a couple of weeks. Um, let people know how they need to deal and respond to it. So any questions around um, planning and preparing? Otherwise, I'll move on. Uh, not at the moment, but please, um, and I think, Michael, you put your hand up. Um, so do put any questions you have in the chat and we'll, um, we'll ask them as we go. Hello, Michael, <laughs> and hello, Julie. For, thank you for joining in. So I wanted to talk to, about empathy, emotional intelligence, leadership, and authority. Before COVID-19, as a leader, you were focused on driving profits and generating new leads and gaining market share. But in these turbulent times, um, the responsibilities of leaders have drastically changed. And you're now making um, sort of decisions around protecting your business, supporting your team and your clients and managing the fears and doubts and angsts and worries of the team and those of your clients while managing your own feelings as well. So during a crisis, people's concerns intensify. Their entire life has been upended. Um, and it's likely that they're more stressed than normal. Your community needs to communicate with a balance of empathy and authority, a balance of warmth and strength. Good communication comforts, educates and prepares. Poor communication can lead to a lack of trust and exasperate panic. I thought that was um, a really good phrase there. Um, good communication comforts, educates and prepares. Poor communication leads to a lack of trust and exasperates panic. And I think especially, sorry, just to jump in, given the, the role and position that accounts and bookkeepers play in their clients' lives alongside a lawyer and a doctor, I mean, there's almost no one sort of more important from a business perspective. So they turn to you when they don't know 
the answers they turn to you for that guidance and for that comfort. And, and so um, just by the uniqueness of your position, you already have that authority. Um, and so it's a, a brilliant, I suppose, time to really acknowledge that and, um, and, and give that comfort to, to your clients because that's what they expect every day and no more so than during a crisis when they will be desperate for it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it does offer um, an opportunity um, to step up, to inspire, to comfort people um, and to build a trusting relationship. Like, you know, like uh, it's a, a great opportunity to build this trusting relationship so that in the future, when they think of these issues, they do come to you. When they think of who do I need to talk about this, it's you. Um, so I do want to briefly talk to you about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence or emotional quotient um, refers to the ability to identify your own emotions and those of others and harness them to apply the tasks and to regulate and manage them. So it's using um, your own emotions to help understand your community and, and, and the people that you're dealing with and help work through that with them. Um, and to stand back from this slightly, um, we've been bombarded as the accounting and bookkeeping community. For years, we've been bombarded with messages telling us that robots are taking over the accounting profession. Yet during these highly stressed times, we've never been more human. We've relied on the robots to actually do the back end lifting while we've connected with our clients and our community and we've never been more human. Um, so I really want to um, highlight and sort of make you aware of the emotional intelligence and aspects of this. And, and I really think going forward, um, the role of the advisor and trusted advisor, whatever you want to call it, does rely heavily on both your knowledge, your skills, your experience, and your emotional intelligence. And we are including, I mean, I put, I, I sent, uh, we probably include some resources on emotional intelligence in the follow up email. So let's me move to the, in terms of um, our emotional intelligence um, and, and communicating with our client and our community and our team, we need to actively listen. We need to hear what they're saying. Um, and this requires both body language and verbal cues. Um, so it can be simply smiling, using warm and relaxed tones. One of the things I frequently do is while I'm in a meeting, I drink tea. <laughs> so, and I just like, I won't drink it there, but it just sort of shows the warmth that we are actually together and we're drinking tea and we're calm and this is normal. Um, acknowledge their concerns. Solidarity is really important and can help people feel so much better about their situation to hear that everyone, many, many others are going through the same thing. Um, so you could say things like, you're right to feel the way that you do or it's easy to be overwhelmed at this time and it helps them feel connected with you and so you can build an open discussion and help them move forward be flexible to their circumstances um, maybe that is a bit of out of hours work maybe that is responding um, when you wouldn't necessarily respond be appreciative of what they're going through um, and, and see how you can work with them. I know during this time, a lot of bookkeepers and accountants have worked extraordinary hours and have worked many weekends and that flexibility um, has, has significantly helped your community. Of course, you need to protect yourself, but that, that um, during crisis communications, that's something that, that potentially is needed. Consider the medium or the platform that you're responding on and how they're going to receive that. Okay. Build trust, which is something that we have talked to. Show confidence in the delivery of the message. Even if you don't know what the answer is, that's okay. Share the facts, share what you understand, share what you know at the time and let them know how you're going to proceed. When I have further information about this, I will contact you um, and that's okay. Um, it's the no one, I'm the person in authority and this is all we know to date. And we are told that the information will come out in three days time 
and we will deal with you and we'll communicate that to you clearly and concisely then. Empower them with facts. So I'm going to talk further to this, but give them the facts. Assume that they are, work with them being intelligent and they can read or absorb the facts or they can come back and ask you further about them. Give it to them in black and white. Remain calm and practice what you preach. Um, behave in a, uh, do what you're saying to your whole community and yourself. Um, and so a lot of the communication may well be internally or externally. Um, your audience is more likely to listen to what you have to say when they feel you're on their side. Through empathy, you earn the permission and the authority to lead your team, your clients and your community in a way that makes them feel confident in your messaging and trusting you as a leader. But I do want to caveat this with a note. If you're naturally a highly empathetic person, what people are going through means that you're feeling it a lot and you need to um, protect your energy and your energy levels as well. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons I try and use as much technology um, as possible to try and protect your energy and save something in the tank for yourself. So, did you have any um, comments on that, um, Charles, in, in terms of your experience of uh, the crisis communication and, and using empathy and emotional intelligence in leadership? Yeah, look, and I was just a couple of points. And I, the firstly, um, when you were saying in terms of being considerate of the medium that you respond, I think this also applies to uh, who you're dealing with and a type of medium that they would feel most comfortable on. So for example, I was speaking with my father earlier and I was trying to get him on a Zoom call and that was disastrous. I mean, it took us about 20 minutes and what I should have done was give him a phone call and then an email because he's late seventies and that's what he's really most comfortable with. Um, you know, if I was speaking to someone in their sort of twenties and thirties, forties, like I am, you know, then doing a Zoom call would be appropriate. Um, if I was dealing with someone you know, quite a lot younger then maybe it would be uh, reach out via text and then follow up the phone call. So um, as Heather said, you can use different technologies to connect in the most appropriate way with your clients. Um, and then technology is obviously a great way in terms of doing heavy lifting for you. So um, when you were talking about doing sort of a weekly a Q and A, um, that could be done like we are on a Zoom call. You know, you could get all your clients, uh, they could log in from where, wherever they are, and you could then just go through and it could either be a prepared statement that you sort of release and maybe it's on sort of um, some policy regulations or something to do with COVID-19, or maybe it's just an ask me anything where your clients get to ask you, you know, what's concerning them. Um, now, obviously, you probably wouldn't want to charge for that, but if you turn it around and say, look, I just dealt with 20 questions from 15 different clients, most of whom will follow up with me afterwards, and then I can have a billing conversation with them. Well, that's actually a really great way of showing the value that um, you're putting into the relationship. And I know that they'll appreciate you all the more for it um, because you're demonstrating that you're willing to um, give and be generous as well as um, obviously, you know, as a necessity charging for your expertise. Yeah, absolutely. And those Q&A webinars, because like even at the start of uh, this webinar as part of a um, sign up process, we asked people what their concerns were. Um, and, and we had so many responses. And it's easy for us or anyone to sit in their own teacup or their own echo chamber and think what everyone's thinking. But actually hearing their responses means you are in a, a position to build out and respond appropriately to their concerns, to concerns that you may not have even considered, but realize, well, maybe um, in, from an, an accountant's or bookkeeper's perspective, there's something that I can productize here and actually um, offer to my clients. Um, you know, and it's not all around making money, but it is all around, it is all around sort of how you're running the business and how you're serving um, your clients. Mm. And I think uh, in terms of the questions that people uh, you know, in this case that you, you sort of gave to us your answers. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, by the time we've seen 150 answers, A, there are some themes coming out, um, which as, as Heather said, you may or may not have been aware of, but also, you know, some of them might be surprising and you might sort of think to yourself, 
what is that person really asking? You know, they're talking about something, but I know they're stressed. I know they're, you know, there's a drought on, maybe if they're a farmer that you're going through a hard sort of time. So what's sort of underneath the question? And, and that might open up a whole nother line of um, uh, discussion that you could have with them. And, and that might then end up with, you know, other products or services that you can sell them. But the, the key there was to sort of say, okay, they sort of, in their moment of panic, they sort of blurted out a, a response or, a, or an answer, but what's, what's really driving them? And I think that's, to the empathy point, um, really something to keep an eye out on. You know, what, what is driving that question that they're asking? Now, Charles, do we have a poll to run? Uh, we didn't have a poll okay. only because I ran a poll in the last one and I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to take up the time, but uh, we were talking about how people communicated um, with their clients, was it email um, or social? And look, the vast majority, especially in the last um, few weeks, have said that they have um, obviously done a lot of phone calling, um, but they just realized that phone calling was just far too time, uh, time expensive. You know, they might have five or six phone calls, each of which could last a good 45 minutes. So they were trying to move their communications both onto email and in some are also trying to move it out, out onto social media where it might be um, certain updates would be appropriate for social media um, because they knew that their clients who are flicking through, um, you know, if they follow them, are flicking through it would sort of would get the message. So definitely the, I think there's been a, a trend away from um, that sort of, especially face to face by, you know, matter of necessity, but even the voice calls as, you know, Tether said, you guys have been incredibly busy. So driving efficiency um, has never been more important. Yes, and, and I, I, it is an interesting one. And I do think that I am speaking to some people who are recognizing that they're gonna move out from being stuck behind um, um, the monitor and, and have a lot more phone calls. And I know phone calls can be very consuming, um, but they can also um, develop um, long, strong, uh, face-to-face -face meetings can be very consuming, but they can also develop long, strong um, relationships. And it's about properly balancing them in the way that you're delivering services from your business. So we're moving on to um, talk about difficult conversations. And I did wonder uh, what image Charles was gonna find for difficult conversations. <laughs> it's funny little one of um, um, two men um, um, precariously perched on a, on, on a tight rock. <laughs> was so, uh... That was actually, um, I, I studied classics a long time ago at university, and it was the Gordian Knot, which um, Alexander the Great, uh, basically, in, instead of trying to undo, which no one could, he took a, a, a sword and cut through it. But I thought oftentimes difficult, difficult conversations are like a knot where you don't quite know how to unpick it um, and where to get started. So I thought maybe a good representation of, yes. um, of that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We got a lot more there than we bargained for. So sometimes when it comes to difficult conversations, um, we have to deliver bad news. We have to increase prices. We have to collect fees. We have to tell a client they can't do something because it's dodgy and they argue that it's not fair. We have to discuss sensitive um, subjects. We have to um, move on difficult clients. Um, we have to talk about projects or meetings that have gone wrong. We have to have um, difficult conversations. And I'm not fond of difficult conversations. I'm not sure whether um, you are, Charles. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone is. But <laughs> in my experience, they get easier the more you have them. At least the practice of them gets easier. I think the antagonist is, likes a difficult conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're made for it. If only we could uh, uh, bring them on board to, to have our, our difficult conversations. But look, what we want to do is talk you through some techniques that can help you. Um, I want to, so I'm going to move to the next slide. I want to um, remind you that when you are approaching a difficult conversation, plan, prepare and practice for the conversation. And through that, you will be in a better place to control the conversation and you'll develop your muscles for having that conversation. Because many of these things, just as interpreting finances, just as um, um, processing GST as a muscle, you'll, you'll develop your muscle for difficult conversations. I also want you to check on the mental health and well-being of the person that you're speaking to. 
and also of your, your yourself. So are they in a place to receive a difficult conversation? And are you in a place to actually have that difficult conversation? And if not, is there the opportunity for it to be delayed? So I really think it's important that we, um, we, we always circle back to that because it, it, it is very strange, strange and unusual times. So let's see. So this is, oh, I th okay, so the first one, I must, have, I must have trimmed off the first one. So the first one on this list, and we'll update the list for the, um, um, webs the, the, the slide, but is about establishing goals. Establish what you want to achieve from having the conversation. Um, are your goals realistic? Do you need to taper them back to become realistic so the out outcome it, it can be achieved? Um, remembering that it may not be the outcome uh, that the person wants and it's not necessarily a negotiation. You're telling them something that they don't want to hear. But what are the realistic goals of this? Be upfront about it. State the message clearly and concisely. Remember, they may get emotional and they may get distracted by the rest of the message. So you want to be upfront about what you um, are telling them, talking to them about. Be in control. Proactively control the conversation. Preempt any distractions, preempt objections, preempt blame. Think through how they may respond and maybe include that in your conversation. So I know this seems look a little bit far-fetched, but you may want to script out how this conversation is going to go and think through how they're going to object and preemptively include responses to those objections. Don't lay blame, don't judge them. Um, you want to get to your goal. You want to manage the outcome of, receiving, of, of achieving that goal. Um, paraphrase. So talk to them about it. Demonstrate that you're listening to them by summarising how they respond, but also ask them clarity about what you've told them. Also ask them to, to, to come back to you on what you've said to them. Make sure that they understand stand it. Be ready for bad reactions. Um, you've got to try and control the situation. Be calm, be prepared, and be emotionally um, in yourself ready um, for bad reactions. And look, you will need to gauge how potentially bad those, those reactions are going to be. Um, and if necessarily have someone around uh, with you. Um, look, you know, I've, I've heard instances of um, during these difficult times, accountants having pot plants thrown at them. Um, so your safety and your security is paramount in these situations. This one really helps me. Perspective. If you do plan it, you script out the, 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 the talk that you're going to have, sit at it and look at it from perspective of three or five, oh, five years in advance and look back on it. If you don't have this conversation now, where are you going to be? If you have this conversation now, where are you going to be? Right now, right in this moment, it might be daunting, but um, you might be able to reset the situation to have a successful outcome and to achieve um, a, a journey that you want and, and that's going to work for you um, and everyone um, that, that, that you're dealing with and that you're communicating with. Um, so sort of structural, and, and I will update the other one with the, the first one, which was establishing goals. So it kind of gives you a structure for having um, a difficult conversation. Um, did you have any thoughts on that, Charles? Yeah, I was just going to say a couple of um, a couple of you uh, put in your notes in terms of issues with communicating with clients that procrastination uh, was a big one. And look, um, you know, I feel you on that. I think um, everyone, to a greater or lesser extent, can can have a bit of the procrastination uh, jet has come on them. Um, but what I like about these sort of steps here is, um, you know by having the goals and sort of being upfront and, and sort of going through the steps, it actually gives you a bit of a framework, um, even as it acknowledges that there will be difficult times through it, because let's face it in life, um, it, it, there will be difficult times. But I think 
you know, if you can sort of uh, put it in a put it in a box that you know you sort of have to um, work through, uh, it, you'll always, even if the conversation itself is very difficult, there's a reason why you're having it. You're not having it because it's for fun or because you don't need to have it. You're having it because it, you absolutely need to have it because it affects your business or your client's business, and so it has it has to happen. Um, and so you definitely, like everyone knows, don't want to get into the situation of uh, not having these conversations because it would be bad for you or bad for your client. Um, so I think, you know, having this little list here, um, I think would be a, a really great help. I and mean, I might print it out actually and, and sort of keep it by my computer. Just sort of <laughs> some little techniques that um, when you know they're coming up, sort of like for the webinar, you can sort of prepare a few notes and just know that, you know, when you're going into it, you're, you're more prepared. And the last thing I would say is um, maybe if there's a breathing exercise you use, um, just, just before you sort of go in and have the conversation, just to sort of reset your breath, because breathing um, will be really important in terms of how your nervous system is sort of reacting during that conversation. If you can start off feeling sort of level and balanced, that will really help um, as the conversation progresses. Yeah, absolutely. So fully encourage the breathing. And and when I did talk to the script, um, I would actually uh, run that script through with a neutral person. Um, so I was, <laughs> I know it sounded a bit far-fetched, but depending on the situation, run the script through and actually talk to a neutral person and see how they receive it and respond to it. Um, and you actually physically get that calmness of breath coming through you and you actually... <laughs> it's kind of going through your mouth and, and, and coming out completely. So you can read something, something in black and white text is a lot different to actually something coming out of your uh, mouth. So let me move on to my next slide, which is, oops, I'm moving on. Um, I wanted to briefly talk to you about words. I know that sounds a bit weird and a bit bizarre, but I kind of like, you know, we could say grammar, we could say tone of the conversation. Um, I talked to you as someone who's written a lot of books, um, who writes a lot of blog articles, who's worked with many editors, but I'm essentially an accountant. I'm an accountant, I'm a bookkeeper. Um, <laughs> and, but I do use a lot of words and a lot of writing in my day to day. So I want to let you know that it is completely acceptable. It is completely acceptable for your communication messages to be conversational in a conversational language. You can use short sentences. You can use simple words. You can use contractions like didn't or wouldn't. And depending on your client base, it may be okay to use emojis. I say this because many of us went through um, school and we had this formalized um, way that we had to write. And we kind of think that we have to take that into small business world. Many of our clients in the small business world don't need you to um, speak in such or write or communicate in such a formal way. Um, they, you can pull it back and talk to them as if you were in a cafe um, and just talking to a friend. And they can be far more easier for them to actually re, uh, be receptive to that. Um, further to this, I'd be careful about using exclamation marks when communicating around a crisis. Um, it indicates a very strong feeling. So I would be mindful of where you are using an exclamation mark. Um, it's okay to be lighthearted light and conversational in your communication. Um, and as I've said, um, be soothing. Use a soothing and comforting narrative. Um, you explain or communicate to them in a language that they understand. If you're dealing with people who are speaking different languages, um, you may need to explore translating your language um, or, or what you're messaging. Um, and I also wanted to highlight on a side note here in terms of accessibility. Um, when you, um, you need to understand how your uh, client base, if we're talking to our client base or our staff base, are actually receiving their messages. And what I do suggest is when you're actually onboarding new clients, ask them how they want to receive that information. Um, and, and one of the side things that I've learned along the way is 8% um, of men are colorblind. 
So build that into your branding, that perception, because um, that's a lot, potentially a lot of people who can't see red and can't see green. And if you're using them as alert colors in your messaging, just be, just be sort of something to be conscious and aware of. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that and the tone of the language we use during communication, um, Charles? Yeah, look, I think this just all goes back to empathy um, and that emotional connection. And uh, if you're talking about something, um, especially if it's difficult and sort of using super formal language, uh, it just they're already uh, sort of taking in difficult information. So they don't sort of necessarily need this, the full... Uh, the King's English sort of backing it up. If you can speak to them in a manner that diffuses a little bit, even just subtly, the um, the information and helps them on board it, um, I, I think it's all helped. And I think, you know, it is subtle, um, but I think it's the subtleties which will, um, you know, in combination with uh, the way that you communicate your tone, all the rest of it will actually make a bit of a difference to how your clients react. And And ultimately, if you are communicating with them say via an email and then you're following up with a, a call, um, it just hopefully will put them at least in a certain frame of mind so that you can then continue the conversation in that more conversational tone because that's eventually what you'll end up doing. You will end up having that face-to-face -face or phone call conversation and it would be a little bit odd if your persona in emails and your persona in real life were just completely, you know, at, at sort of at odds with each other. So, you know, Act, act on, um, on your emails as you would, I suppose, um, in your calls and face-to-face -face meetings. Absolutely, absolutely. I do like that uh, you reference King's English. I don't think you're a young man. You wouldn't have ever been alive for the King's English. <laughs> um, so I'd like to move on to, this is really weird, and some of you may have seen it and some of you may have not have seen it, but it's the acronym TLDR, which is very simply too long, didn't read. So you're looking at it and you probably have seen it in a few places and may not have picked up what it means. So typically if there's a long message, you may see TLDR at the top and it also may be at the bottom. And essentially it's a summary of the message. Um, it's for those people who don't read but below the fold. It's those people who won't scroll down the message. And what you're doing is you're summarizing your message. You're, you're, you're summing it all up in one sentence. And look, honestly, maybe that's the only message you need to send out. But we did talk about supplying them with facts and information. And we are accountants and bookkeepers. And sometimes, unfortunately, they need to know a lot of stuff. Um, but including that at the top sums it up for them so they can go, okay, I need to uh, remember to, 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 to read this. Um, and um, it's a useful way for sharing information um, and uh, getting messages out there so they can be receptive to, okay, okay, I've received it. I'm feeling overwhelmed at the moment. I kind of know what it's about and I'm going to put it aside and then read it back when, when I um, um, need to uh, absorb it and when I have the capacity to absorb it. Um, and many people have suggested to me Twitter is a great place to actually craft a TLDR it's a great way to concisely write things so people can understand them because it's limited to 280 characters. So you need to get to the point quick and without any fluff. And that's okay. Um, we're talking about conversational language um, and the rest of the, 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 the blurb or the message may be conversational, but this is it. They're, they're just quick, concise. This is what you need to know. Um, Charles, do yeah. You this? Well, I think it, it goes. Well, I, so I haven't done it personally, but I think it does go back to uh, you know when you onboard your clients, or if you've got clients you've had for a long time, it's about um, seeing those expectations in terms of communication and how you're going to um, <laughs> oh bless you communicate with them, so that um, if they do see this at the top of an email, they know what it is, um, you know what it means. Uh, and look, many, many different, uh, I suppose, accounts and bookkeepers will communicate in different ways with their clients. And we're not saying in any way is, is better than the others, but it's just about making sure that your clients understand the way in which you communicate and make sure it works for them. And, you know, so that you can get out the key information when you need it to. Absolutely. 
So we also, um, a, a, a natural part of ma many of our businesses is using social media. And I wanted to talk about um, where does managing crisis communication and difficult conversations, and where does social media fit into this? And we um, um, pulled up this, uh, this is from the Instagram page of, um, uh, I think it's a, a Brisbane um, uh, accounting company. And they have just done a great job of um, um, using some fun images and, and giving some information around uh, what you're doing and, and resonating and comforting and providing sort of some comfort there. So I, I think they've actually done a really good job of being upfront about it, dealing with it, but, but, but pulling you in. Mm. Um, I was just gonna say the nice thing about these is that um, they're not necessarily saying that they have something to say. They're not necessarily commenting on a specific uh, regulation that's come out. They are just acknowledging that in this situation, um, everyone will be going through things and they understand and they're sort of empathizing with, with you. And um, the top one, I mean, everyone's seen friends and there's lots of great memes, but I think, uh, you know, it's just acknowledging the reality of people's lives. And that after all is, is kind of what um, everyone's clients as well as the bookkeepers and accounts are going through. I mean, for a period, everyone has been working at home. So it's not just that they're saying that their clients are doing it, it's that they're doing it as well. So it's telling their story as well. And then the second one, I just thought it was a, a really fantastic way of, I suppose, the, the metaphor for the flexibility and resilience that small businesses are gonna need at the moment. Um, so, you know, the nice thing, uh, if you sort of, if I couldn't get it in the picture, but, you know, scrolling down, it was very much a, um, a call to action stating that they have the expertise and the uh, capabilities to help businesses in this time. So you sort of see the two different types. One is sort of a, a much more fun and empathetic one. And the second one is um, more down to business, uh, acknowledging that, um, you know, times are going to be um, unusual for a period, but also stating that um, Ferris Financial can help. And, and that really sort of showcases two of the different elements of social media, kind of the fun side, um, but also the ability for it to drive new conversations and hopefully um, new business for yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And you feel like you know them. You feel like you're ready to connect with them and these people um, are good people and you can work with them. And that's what, you know, the, the social media is for. It's like that warm cafe conversation. So, yes, you can use social media for crisis communication. Um, keep it consistent with your brands and, and branding. Um, keep the messages calm and brief with uh, links back to further information where relevant. Don't, um, and as we've talked about, don't inflame the situation. Don't use ambulance emojis or zombie emojis or exclamation marks. Don't cause extra stress or worry or concern. Put out messages of comfort. Um, but also, if you are using social media, don't neglect to update your website with your relevant crisis communications. Um, some people spend so much time on their social media, they forget to cross post the information. Um, so you might want to post on social media, then post back to uh, your website and also include the actual relevant um, um, source um, for what, if you are sharing uh, relevant information around tax stimulus information. Different platforms suit different messages. Um, so you sort of need to understand that. And we did run a webinar um, a while ago on social media. So perhaps you'll include that in the follow-up email or you can find it on the BOMA website to get some further understanding of how you can um, um, use social media in your business. Um, I was just going to make the point that, uh, and that's really driven to a large extent by your clients. Um, you, may, you may know that a lot of your clients are on LinkedIn, um, they, they may be on all the channels or specifically they may only be on one or two channels. So while you personally may be on Twitter because it's a really fantastic resource for you personally and professionally, um, not all of your clients maybe. I mean, maybe they might be on Facebook and Instagram or LinkedIn. So just, just think about where your clients might be and the easiest way, if you're not sure, um, is to ask a few of them. Um, you know, that's a really nice way uh, and, and you know, you'll find that if 10 or 15 of your clients say they're all using specific um, platforms, you know, 
relatively speaking, you could extrapolate that out and say, okay, well, most of my clients probably are going to be on those same platforms. So, um, and I only make this point because uh, if you're none of your clients are on a specific platform, you don't want to be spending time there just because um, you're busy. And so um, we don't need to sort of doing anything that isn't going to be sort of driving an ROI uh, sort of back for you, whether it's from a brand perspective or sort of a client engagement perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And um, part of the onboarding process for new clients can be asking them what platforms they're on and part of the updating even of their annual tax information. You may want to slip in some fun questions to, again, ask them those questions um, to get the information. Um, so one of the things I did also want to talk about in terms of price communication and social media is that it's important for us to uh, remember we have personal and professional identities and it can be easy during these highly stressful times to blur them um, and to um, um, get them mixed up in terms of the messages that we're sending out there. I think it's really important to be authentic, but there's a lot of opinions and there's a lot of things that we're dealing with at the moment. And if you have strong opinions that, you know, are not necessarily those of your client base, you may want to pull back off, off um, social media and just keep them to your um, private or intimate community. Um, it, can get, it can be very off-putting um, for communities. I know um, we had one example of um, a software vendor jumped into an accounting forum and started complaining that all the accountants were whining because of the long hours and they shouldn't be complaining about that and they should be grateful that they had all this work on. Um, and people have really long memories and it was kind of like a very difficult situation. You've got to remember you've got your personal and your professional brand identities and those sorts of situations can be very awkward um, and difficult going on, ongoing. Um, and also in terms of your, uh, you know, personal professional, I know one of the wonderful accountants, she's been doing all of her updates on TikTok. Um, but that's just simply, she keeps them all personal and she puts out these funny updates on TikTok, but she doesn't share that business wise, um, which is great. You know, she just worked out that something sort of fun for her to do. Um, I think with all these platforms, use the internet for good and, and not for evil. Um, so quoting Laurel and uh, Wilson, who uh, posted that up recently on the internet. Um, yeah, so that was kind of something that I did want to touch on um, in terms of how you're using social media. Did you have anything more to um, add there? No, look, I, I think we've covered it pretty extensively, but as, as like, like I couldn't agree more. Um, the internet's a wonderful place um, and we should all uh, use it for, as you say, the better side of things rather than going down the, uh, the negative side. Yeah, I, 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 prim I never put anything negative up on the internet. Always keep it positive and happy um, and, 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 and realistic and authentic, but uh, we can keep it that way. So let's talk about my favourite topic, which is technology <laughs> and, and what sort of technology tools that we can use um, through managing crisis communications and difficult conversations. So we have talked about a lot of them. We've got the different platforms um, and we talked about um, Zoom and we talked about, um, so we talked about Zoom and doing webinars. So a couple of things that I did want to uh, run through, run by you, um, is that Sometimes when you're working with people, um, they don't have the right technology at their end to receive your communication message properly. They may have bandwidth issues. They may not have the technology properly. They may be doing everything on like an iPhone and can only see it that much. Um, and, and so they may not be getting the full message. So if you send them a, a massive graphical image that, you know, it may come through and, and, and mess up what they're seeing and they can't see it properly. So be mindful of that. Um, also, sometimes when you're dealing with people, and I've spoken to a number of people about this, in the work from home situations, the person at the home end didn't want to share uh, didn't want to do visual um, um, videos with them because they didn't want people to see what their home looked like. Um, so that's something. So it's being aware of what technology people are using and, and uh, how, how you're dealing with them. One of the things I did mention right at the start was something um, templated responses or canned phrases. And this is kind of a, a, a bit of a techie thing, but if you Google text expander, 
there's a number of them out there and you can um, adopt them and, and use them to um, send in or to, to include regular responses to people to just um, just take off the edge of when you are replying to people and just save some of that emotional energy for yourself. Um, also want to highlight um, visuals and visual mediums are really good during um, crisis communication. So uh, we have talked about um, webinars, you've got Zoom and Skype and Google Hangouts and live events on Facebook. Um, you also have, uh, you can use tools like Camtasia or Snagit videos to create um, short little videos. So, um, and also we, we, we're currently on Zoom. And so one of the things I'll do on Zoom, you can put the soft focus in so you look a lot better. Um, and uh, for me, I personally, I, I, I put a, a, a screen, sh a backdrop in just to add some color and brightness to the um, um, session. The other thing that you may be using either for your clients or goodness, I know that um, every man and his llama has invited me to Slack in the last few weeks. Um, so a lot of people are using Slack for the uh, option of doing um, uh, instant messaging. And so what you are, what you may want to do with your team is to have an area, a lighter area um, for light discussions, for sharing of memes, for sharing of cat videos, so that they can, um, when they do need to let off some steam, they have areas uh, to do that, even though they're working virtually, because they don't necessarily have the sort of the water cooler uh, situation anymore. And um, we, I, I'm just going to flip to this next screen image. This is something, I'm not sure where the source of it is, but it's awful, okay? So I apologise for it, but I'm going to share it with you. This is a message that was going around, and you can see it's like a chat box here saying, are you in the right headspace to receive information that could possibly hurt you? This is a bad use of robots. I'm sure everyone watching this goes knows that this is a bad use of robots. Um, and, and this is not what we're suggesting. We're suggesting um, uh, good, strong responses um, uh, that are empathetic and encouraging. And, and if that's, that's the situation, that needs to be a human having that conversation, not a robot. Mm -hmm. Did you have any um, technology or conversation you wanted to add to that, um, uh, Charles? Yeah, look, and I think we have touched on it um, during the webinar, but ultimately technology um, really is to there to, I suppose, help you do some of the heavy lifting. So we've talked about webinars um, and also sort of communication tools like Slack um, and Google and Google Documents. When it comes to your staff, um, if they are either working at home um, at present or maybe they're spending a bit more time working from home, I definitely know in New Zealand, that's becoming more popular, the sort of three days in the office, two days out. Um, I would definitely think about how they would then um, do their job from home. So making sure that they are able to then uh, communicate effectively. So do they have uh, the right laptop? Do they, is their Wi-Fi quick enough? Um, you know, small things like that, um, which uh, if, it's all, if it's all up to speed, um, that's fantastic. But equally, if it's not, um, then suddenly you've got one or more of your staff who are having trouble either connecting with clients or connecting within the, within your work team um, in a way that will maybe disadvantage them and obviously, um, you know, disadvantages the, the organization as a whole. So making sure that your staff have the right technology is, is really important. Luckily, most of it these days can be done um, it's like a SaaS product, so you can, you don't have to sort of buy the CD, you can just sign up online, and as long as your internet's fast enough, you can, you can use it fully. Um, the other thing I would say, um, and obviously as, as Heather said, this is a, a terrible example of an of a automated canned response. Um, I have seen some examples of good chatbots on a website. So if someone comes in and maybe has a question or wants to know something, um, you obviously can uh, connect that to someone doing live answers, um, but obviously that only uh, works when they're in the office. Um, so you can, and, and we have it at BOMA, we've got a whole lot of questions that people can ask and our chatbot picks out key phrases. So if someone asks about pricing or someone asks about how to do a specific thing, um, our chatbot can sort of give them like, is it one of these five responses that would help you? So the person can then obviously go on and say, look, no, it's not. And I'd like to speak to a, a person. 
um, either via email or sort of a live person. But it, in the meantime, it might solve their problem. And you know, if it's late at night, then solving the problem then and there for them is actually really, really important rather than waiting uh, for the next business day. So, um, you know, as I said, technology can, can work for us and it can, I suppose, enable us to be more responsive to our clients. Um, as Heather said though, just make sure that you uh, implement it in the right way and especially consider the, the fact that there will be a human on the other end of it. So um, yeah, always have that, that at the top of your mind. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Charles. Um, and I wanted to, to um, wrap it up with, now we are running out of time, um, but if you do have any questions, drop them in the chat box. I wanted to wrap it up again, um, talking about mental health and wellness. As bookkeepers and accountants, we're not professional counsellors and no one expects us to be, but we're humans dealing with other humans and we should have um, some appreciation, look, of the mental health and wellness of people during challenging crisis times um, and especially when uh, they, they could be heightened. Um, I think at a minimum you should gauge um, someone's state of mind when you're talking to them and assess if they have the strength to hear your message or have a difficult conversation with them. Um, but that's something that you're going to need to gauge. But I'd also like to add, I also think you, it, it can be very useful if you have a standard mental health and wellness resource that you can provide to them for assistance. Many of the uh, people that you are partners with, such as your professional associations, um, such as your uh, software partners, will be able to provide you with um, copies that you, of, of those resources. So you don't necessarily need to create them, but you can provide them that way. Um, furthermore, uh, the crisis situation, the high intensity period will end. Make sure with whatever is happening in your world and in your life, you are looking after yourself. So thank you um, very much. Um, have any questions come in, Charles? Do you have anything more to, to add to that? Uh, look, no, nothing has come in now. Um, but one that I wanted to raise, uh, which was a question in the registration form, was what to do about clients who go quiet. Because I thought that's actually quite a difficult one because when they, they sort of gone quiet, um, you know, the power, I suppose, sort of subtly shifts. So how would you deal with, with a client who maybe for whatever reason stops answering calls or sort of emails and kind of not necessarily ghosts you, but kind of is, is suddenly off the reservation a little bit? So I had an example of a, a very long-term client that went quiet and um, stopped responding to my emails. I phoned and the phone had gone dead. I then put a message on Facebook to say, was anyone in the area and could see, could, could answer my questions? And someone came back to me and said, oh, I'm in that street. I can answer your questions. And they, um, so, so I took it to a private area and he said that the business, there was no one at the business who I was referencing, who I needed to speak to, but there was a business next door, um, which was a uh, Vietnamese shop. So I then called the Vietnamese shop and said, do you know what's happened to um, this client who was at a cafe? And she said, oh, yes, he's just here. Would you like to speak to him? And so she, <laughs> she wandered over with her mobile phone to speak with him. And everything was okay. It's just that all of his, um, uh, he changed web providers which meant that all of his email, he lost access to all of his emails and all of his website and, and his phone wasn't working. Um, and uh, I actually got to communicate with him that way. So it was a really weird, uh, I, I, I wondered if he just disappeared, but he hadn't, he, he just, that technical thing. So don't think necessarily the worst, just try and work through all of the avenues of trying to um, get, get in touch with them. Um, and you can see I use a number of different ways there. Oh, brilliant. Um, well, look, uh, oh, and, uh, and thanks, Kerry. And, and just a suggestion from Kerry, who was saying, uh, if you're dealing with one, someone who goes quiet, oftentimes they're a member of uh, a couple, so you can always reach out to the other person maybe involved in the business. Yeah, that's a really yeah. top um, bit of advice there. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Kerry. 
Um, so, um, so if there's no more Q&A, and I think that if, if stuff does come in, we can potentially answer it. But uh, <laughs> these are your slides, so I'm going, oh, we're at conclusion. We've wrapped up very tightly on one o'clock. So that was uh, well done to us, Charles. Well, brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Steve. I think, uh, as always, you've um, given such an insightful um, and interesting sort of point of view on this. And um, gosh, let's hope that um, what we've learned today, we only have to put into practice on the sort of low level crises that we've had, not the, not the most recent one. Just, um, yeah. So best of, um, best of luck to everyone out there. If you've got any questions, um, you can always reach us at support at bomamarketing.com. Uh, we'll be following this up with an email tomorrow, which will have a recording. So if you, if there's anyone you want to share it with, um, you can obviously do that, or it'll be on our website in the coming days. Um, and Heather, thanks again so much for all, all your insight here. Awesome. And now everyone, oh, look, now all the questions are coming in. <laughs> <laughs> You've missed out. <laughs> so thank you everyone for listening in. Um, that was great. Um, look forward to um, the next one. And thank you, Charles. Brilliant. Thanks again. And uh, see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone.